My name is Mario Maldonado. I am an endocrinologist and I am the head of clinical development for global endocrinology at Recordati Rare Diseases. We focus on rare diseases, but uh, more specifically for endocrinology, we focus on uh, pituitary disorders and adrenal disorders, such as uh, Cushing syndrome, which is uh, a situation where there's too much cortisol being produced. Uh, the majority of the cases are from what's called Cushing's disease, which is about 70% of the cases, which is a small tumor in the pituitary gland that produces too much of the hormone called ACTH, which is a hormone that stimulates the adrenals to produce cortisol. There are 30% of patients who have non-pituitary Cushing syndrome. And these are patients that were not extensively studied uh, in, in most Cushing's development programs. And these are patients that either have a, what we call an ectopic ACTH. In other words, this hormone that's normally produced by the pituitary gland can be produced, say, for example, by a lung tumor, a lung cancer. And that cancer is producing ACTH. And it's stimulating the adrenals to produce a lot of cortisol. The other forms of non-pituitary Cushing syndromes are what we would call adrenal Cushing's which are a patient who has an adrenal tumor, be it a benign adenoma or an adrenal cortical carcinoma that's producing too much cortisol. And then there is uh, another rare condition that's called uh, macronodular hyperplasia of the adrenals, where actually both adrenals are producing too much cortisol. Now, why is hypercortisolemia such a problematic issue? It's because the effects of cortisol in many ways can have very in high levels, can have very negative consequences. Cortisol is a crucial stress hormone that we humans and many mammals have. And it's the hormone that uh, helps us deal with stress, with stressful situations. And uh, when it's in excess, you can have an elevation in the blood glucose levels you will have an elevation in blood pressure. People will have uh, chronically exposed to high cortisol levels, will have decrease in their bone mineral density and have a higher propensity for fractures. Uh, it, it can be an immunosuppressant, so too much cortisol circulating will put pa patients at higher risk of, um, of having infections. But ultimately, many patients with Cushing syndrome have cardiovascular events because of the hypertension, the diabetes, kind of like the increased insulin resistance that comes with hypercortisolism. So that's why it's important to control Cushing syndrome. And uh, that this is why we are developing medications for, for this disease. The first line of therapy is given that most of these patients, it's a tumor be it a pituitary tumor, a cancer, cancerous tumor somewhere else in the body, or an adrenal tumor, is to actually surgically remove that tumor. But one thing that we do know is that not all patients are cured by surgery. And some patients, unfortunately, uh, for example, those with ectopic ACTH, they might have a metastatic disease, and you cannot operate all the metastases. And even the metastases are producing too much ACTH and therefore causing the Cushing syndrome. So uh, the second line treatment or first line in those who are not surgical candidates is actually medical therapy. And this is where uh, we have medications that act on this. One medication is called Pasiliotide, which is a somatostatin receptor agonist that decreases the secretion of ACTH. And the other one is Oscilodrosat or Istulisa, which decreases the, the uh, production of cortisol by the adrenal glands. So it acts directly on the adrenal glands, decreasing cortisol levels. We had several abstracts. Um, I'll, I'll begin with uh, Pasiliotide. We had what's a very long-term extension of the initial studies for Pasiliotide in both Cushing's and Acromegaly, which is another pituitary disease of too much growth hormone production. 
and we have shown that there is a, a certain degree of sustainability of the effect of decreasing this hormone overproductions with paseliotide. But also we have uh, several uh, abstracts and posters from uh, Isturiza or Silodrostat, which, uh, for example, we had a abstract from a retrospective study called Link 7. This was a, a, a really important study because it was in 103 patients with non-pituitary Cushing syndrome who were treated in France with Osilovrostat. And this is perhaps one of the largest, if not the largest, databases we have in non-pituitary Cushing syndrome. And with 103 patients, uh, we could do very interesting analyses of the data and actually that show that oscillodorostat is both safe and effective in treating these patients. Then we had uh, a interim analysis from an ongoing prospective non-interventional study called LINK6. LINK6 is in patients who have Cushing's syndrome and we are, it's an observational study and we are recruiting patients who are being treated with oscillodrostat. And we had an interim analysis, again, showing the uh, known efficacy and safety of oscillodrostat in Cushing syndrome. Most of the patients in NIC 6 were Cushing's disease patients. And this poster had about 106 patients in the interim analysis. And then we had an important analysis from our pivotal phase three studies called LINK3 and LINK4 in patients with Cushing's disease. And this was a subgroup analysis or a post hoc analysis of the effects of uh, oscillodrostat on hypertension and hyperglycemia, which again are two of the key complications I mentioned of excess cortisol. And we did see significant reductions in both blood pressure and uh, measures of glycemia, such as the uh, HbA1c. So again, it was another uh, important analysis of our database of uh, really long, m multiple studies in patients with, uh, with Cushing's syndrome or disease. So I think that the important take-home message is that both paseliotide and oscillodrostat are important tools in the management of pituitary disorders and adrenal disorders, more specifically acromegaly or Cushing's disease, uh, especially for paseliotide, and with oscillodrostat for the whole Cushing syndrome spectrum that goes from patients with pituitary Cushing's as well as patients with non-pituitary Cushing's. And uh, I think that we do have a good database of patients, even though these are rare diseases. When you're talking about studies that have more than 100 patients in these rare diseases, these are valuable databases that help us uh, understand how this drug works, to understand the safety. And the important uh, finding in, in all these studies is that the safety profile is consistent with what we know of uh, of our development program with uh, oscillodrostat in Cushing's. So again, it's a, it's a really important database, it's a really important set of, uh, of analyses and studies that we are presenting. Some interesting is that are still ongoing, like the Link 6 program. This is a long-term follow-up, up to three years of observation. And uh, we were aiming to have about 200 patients recruited so with time, we already, we will see once we have the whole database for three years and have a really robust database of a lot of the real world experience. Because again, these are non-interventional studies. So we're not mandating how to use it. We're just asking physicians to follow the USPI or the SMPC, depending or, or the labeled instructions, depending on the country where they're using this. These are multi-center studies that include patients from the US, from Europe, from other countries. And it helps us a lot to understand well the safety and efficacy of, of our products. What I want to add is the commitment that we at Recordati Rare Diseases have into treating rare diseases, to treating the few, to helping patients with rare diseases that are sometimes uh, 
that have all these diseases have unmet medical needs and coming up with solutions for these patients and obviously coming with safe and effective solutions that's probably one of the drivers that we have at Recordati rare diseases into bringing solutions to these patients.